So, my name is David Raker. I'll be talking about a bit about photovoltaic performance modeling today. And what do I mean by that? Well, we're talking about applying sets of uh, physics-based models to all of the different factors which uh, figure in when you're getting from generating solar energy to yeah, actually outputting into the grid, yeah, including things like irradiance, weather, shading factors, the IP characteristics, the models, power conversion, and final output. So why, why would we want to do this? Well, first reason, of course, is that if we take a naive view of what we're going to get out of a photovoltaic array, it's going to look something like this. This is a uh, graph of the actual output of the array in front of the R1 building over a few of the recent days. <laughs> yeah, and we've got a nice smooth curve here. Probably there weren't many clouds out. This is more often what we actually get. Yeah, um, <coughs> and this is a problem if you are trying to, well, first of all, if you're trying to estimate what you're going to get out of a potential array that you're looking to build, the yeah, power output averaged out of this is going to be very different than what you get out of this. Um, on a larger scale, you run into big stability problems also with the grid. Uh, I'm not sure how well you can see this here, but that's about 30 kilowatts up here that, that's coming out. And in a moment, that's going to drop down to around six uh, for working with a 300. Yeah, kilowatt array, as a lot of industrial scale ones are, you just took a couple of hundred yeah, kilowatts suddenly off the grid and transformers explode and bad things happen. Um, when First Solar was here talking in the spring, yeah, they talked about how they actually deal with that. They actually have people you know, running some of these models all the time, looking at weather a little bit out you know, in order to predict what's about to happen. And they keep in a certain amount of capacity offline that they can bring online to adjust for these things to you know, allow for more stability. Um, another reason I want to do this, I'm not sure how well you can see, but this little red line here suddenly has a big spike. And what happened here, there are four rows of modules, each on a yeah, string inverter at the R1 building. And one of those inverters had gone down. Yeah, this wasn't noticed for a few days yeah, until Dr. Ellingson had checked this religiously. Yeah, got off a flight to Switzerland and noticed that yeah, power didn't seem to be what it ought to be. Sent an email and sure enough, yeah, one of the inverters had experienced an arc fault and had gone completely offline. So a quarter of those panels weren't doing anything until I reset that inverter right here. Yeah, if you have a good model of what should be happening with it, you can automate a lot of that and immediately identify you know, problems like that when they arise. Yeah, the inverter could probably raise an alarm, but there are a lot of other things that could happen that would not be as obvious. Yeah, at one point earlier in the summer, we made some repairs to the modules, and we found that a fuse had blown taking a string of about nine panels offline. That's a lot harder to detect by looking at it. So the various things that you know, go into this process, you know, we're working with a lot of separate you know, models for various things, starting from the sunlight coming in, the amount of irradiance that you're actually getting, which of course varies throughout the year and based on you know, weather conditions. Yeah, you saw the spikes from all the clouds going by. Yeah, that then needs to be translated to the actual plane of the array, which may be moving if you have a tracker or maybe stationary. Yeah, um, diffuse and direct irradiance make a big difference in what the array is actually going to output. And so you often don't have good measurements of all of those things. You need to be able to take limited measurements of certain quantities and convert them into a prediction of yeah, other quantities, for example, taking global horizontal irradiance and translating that into, yeah, into something on the plane of the array. You also have yeah, shading and soiling effects on the modules. Yeah, and 
the, uh, the temperature of the modules and more importantly the cells within them makes a big difference on the performance of the actual semiconductors. And then after the module uh, generates its power, yeah, that gets, yeah, that gets yeah, tracked by a yeah, max power point tracking and you also have yeah, losses that come in from, yeah, from different levels between different series and parallel strings of yeah, modules. You're going to lose some at your yeah, inverter and then you're going to lose some along the way yeah, out to the grid. And so all of these things have models involved in them. Now most of my time, um, I focused on yeah, a couple of module, models for calculating the temperature of modules. Um, this is a commonly used one up here. And so yeah, using that as a comparison, it's a fairly simple steady state model. Yeah, we have irradiance and wind speed and the ambient temperature, yeah, this A and B see them are yeah, empirical constants that have to do with the yeah, material configuration of the module. Yeah, and I was taking, yeah, I was trying to improve on, yeah, on this down here. I've yeah, been working with a MATLAB library put out by yeah, Sandia called PBLib. And they have a function for doing this. Yeah, but not for something a bit more complicated here. Now, the steady state model, because it's dependent very heavily on irradiance, it ends up making you know, huge spikes as irradiance changes, for example, if you have cloud cover coming by. And that's fine over a long term. If you're looking at output you know, over, say, a year, and you're trying to predict roughly what you're going to get out of this, that's going to give you a fairly good number. But if you're trying to look at something a bit more yeah, time constrained on a shorter scale, yeah, it's going to end up being way off. So yeah, what I did yeah, is I wrote a number of functions yeah, in MATLAB, first of all, to draw in data from the array that we had out front and from yeah, meteorological data from the yeah, National Climatic Data Center yeah, in order to get weather station data from yeah, nearby places. Yeah, because the big, the big problem you have with something like this is there's a whole lot of stuff getting fed into that. You have a lot of different parameters here. Yeah, um, some of them are fairly yeah, obvious, such as the, the yeah, tilt of your module with respect to the surface that it's on. Yeah, others of them are not so obvious. Yeah, for example, the, the uh, emissivity of the yeah, ground and sky. Uh, for that matter, you probably don't have good data on the temperature of those things. Yeah. So we have basically four components here in a differential equation. We have yeah, long wave heat transfer, short wave heat transfer, convective heat transfer, and the power coming out of the module. Yeah, the notation here and the actual equations are ones that I took from a paper from a, yeah, Jones and Underwood yeah, working out of the uh, University of Northumbria that yeah, developed this. And I also went through some, yeah, 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 some tests from another paper from Sandia, and Hamlin and Stein, which attempt to actually yeah, derive some of the values for these things <coughs> when you don't have a good value. Yeah, my goal here is to improve on this and to find better ways of actually getting inputs for this so this can be used in a real world situation. So the way that yeah, Hamlin and Stein had gone about this, they had held a number of parameters constant, yeah, well everything constant except for one, and then run values that they didn't know through yeah, root mean square error yeah, running over yeah, each value from a yeah, range yeah, and finding a minimum from that. And then they would feed that into a nonlinear optimization algorithm yeah, to determine yeah, optimized values. Yeah. And I ran into some problems when I started implementing this. Yeah. For example, I'm pretty sure that the heat capacity of a module does not come out to around 40,000 joules per Kelvin. You know, my back of the envelope calculations for that came out to closer to 2,500. You know, looking at the key capacity.
opacity of the glass, or working with thin films, the glass is most of the material. Yeah. And when, when we actually take this, this these yeah, calibrations are done over a single day, when you extend them to the full year, yeah, we're getting yeah, around yeah, 5 Kelvin Rubin square error. Yeah, which isn't entirely terrible. Yeah, these are a few of the yeah, of the models that we're running through. The the dotted line here with all of the up and downs. That's our steady state model from the yeah, the Sandia Ray Performance yeah, yeah, model. The blue. Well, the lighter blue line here is our actual measured module temperature from the array. The green one is that uh, Jones and Underwood equation before the calibration, and the darker blue afterwards. I realize this is kind of busy on here. We'll cut some of these out on the next one. And when we look at the error, this is over a single day. Yeah, we can see that the yeah the steady state model is yeah coming out. Yeah, often between about 5 and 15 yeah, Kelvin error from the measure. The, yeah, the heat transfer model is coming a bit closer, but we still have some really nasty yeah, deviance right here, yeah, where that took me quite a while to figure out, and this is yeah, essentially due to a mistake on my part. When uh, Jones and Underwood implemented this in their paper, they ended up simplifying this long wave heat transfer equation, and I naively took their assumption. Yeah, but they're working with a rooftop mounted array. And so the angle between that and the surface that it's mounted on is zero. So that becomes one, that becomes zero, this entire thing drops out, and we're not looking at the uh, heat transfer off the ground. They're also assuming that the temperature off the roof is the same as yeah, yeah, the array. And that probably worked for them. It definitely did not work for our rack mounted array out in front of the building. The, uh, the, when Helen and Stein had done this, the, uh, they were coming out with about the, uh, five, the, uh, 5 to 10 here with these top peaks. And, yeah, this is around 20. Now they were running into something like this when they extended, when they tried to calibrate it on one location and then move to another, which is also a problem for the generalizability of this, and that's why I was hoping to improve, and still am. This is definitely a work in progress. Yeah, so when I take the, yeah, the long wave component out, I still need to improve that, yeah, I, I get a little bit more, yeah, meaningful values. That's a lot closer to what the uh, you know, heat capacity especially should be. This is still probably awfully low. That's the uh, you know, absorptivity of the, the uh, module. Yeah, it's probably far lower than it ought to be, but I do get a much nicer you know, fit. You know, we no longer have our you know, large amount of error down here. Yeah. And we're coming in when that gets averaged over, you're a lot closer to what they were getting in their paper. So I expect that once I actually correct that long wave key transfer component, that we should get much better results. And I can actually start looking a little bit more at yeah, improving the model. Yeah, some of the things that they noted that they had not taken into account, which need improved, yeah, the yeah, University of Northumbria didn't have any way to measure wind speed yeah, for that matter, we don't. I'm using data from the local airport as a you know, analog for it. Yeah, and they were not taking much into account other than a, a fixed linear relationship on wind speed for convective heat transfer. And that can definitely be improved. Um, and taking into account other atmospheric conditions there, such as humidity, that are going to affect that. Um, so. Where I intend to go from here is, of course, to yeah, correct my issue with the orientation of the ray with the yeah, long heat transfer, long wave heat transfer component. 
and we need to find a better way to come up with values for uh, sky and ground emissivities. The, um, the, I'm hoping to take a look at some of the cloud data that's reported from the meteorological stations uh, and see if I can make that the, uh, fit things a little bit better so that that's also generalizable to the uh, data where you don't have, to the location where you don't have specific data. Um, we also do have measurements for actual power output that's using a, a, a fairly simple model to estimate it. So yeah, I need to actually get that put in there and yeah, work to yeah, actually get some improvements on there. Yeah. Some of my references. I just wanted to acknowledge my mentor, uh, Michael Eden, uh, Randy Ellings, and you know, Adam Phillips for answering random questions when I was sitting next to his office. And uh, yeah, Neil and Randy and yeah, they're all working with me yeah, on part of this. Yeah, to yeah, we're also working to yeah, hopefully develop a class around some of these modeling concepts and they yeah, was working with them on getting started with MATLAB and yeah, finding places where you know, that could be yeah, better explained and clarifying my own understanding there. And thank you to uh, Rick and Linda for this program. Of course, thank you to the National Science Foundation for funding all of this. Any questions? the wind speed uh, and the humidity and other things that we have heard. You have this equation of temperature of the module. Do you remember the values of A and B in that? Uh, the values of A and B um, I got from a chart the, uh, that the uh, folks at Sandia had put together for various types of module. They're probably not as best of fits as they could be. Yeah, I should probably try something similar to this uh, calibration that, uh, that they were doing on the other model to see if I get a better fit for those. Um, to were you asking what they were? Around B was, especially I'm interested in the value of B, whether it was positive or negative. Uh, they are both negative. Yeah, they're fairly small. I understand. What is the effect of temperature on the efficiency of the cell on the power output of the cell? Oh, okay, well, as the, uh, as the semiconductor heats, the efficiency with which it's able to, uh, uh, with which it's able to uh, convert energy goes down. Yeah. A lot more, I mean, what's the... Does it stable in a region, or...? It, it, well, it depends on the... Uh, on the material exactly to, to what extent it does. Um, I'm not sure if I... Um, I'm just curious. What, what, is this a parameter that you need to understand or does it not matter much either? Uh, my understanding is that it actually is a fairly important parameter in predicting the output of the module the, um, after irradiance. The, um, that the, the temperature of the cell yeah. Uh, here we're looking at the temperature of the whole module, but yeah, that of course is an input into the temperature, of the, calculating the temperature of the cell. It's very difficult to control the temperature in the external environment. Yes. Yeah, I, I don't think that that's something that really can be controlled a whole lot. Yeah, um, other than obviously in the, you know, the design of materials involved, but once you stick it out in the wild, it's it's going to fluctuate based on what the air temperature is and the radiance it is. So here's the question that I have for the application. Okay. I'm about to put solar panels on a flat roof. Okay. Panels will be angled. Okay. What color do I want to make the roof? Do I want to make them white? In order to <laughs> reduce the thermal variation, do I want to make it dark in order to just the excess light, or what do I want to do? 
Uh, he absorbed the excess light. I suppose so that's going to be re re Yes, it is. Well, it, it turns out that it probably makes a pretty big difference because that's the piece that's missing uh, when I was doing this. Yeah. Um, it was, um, 6 a.m. it's light out. Yeah, um, the, I believe you start getting uh, irradiance data right around here yeah, on the actual numbers coming out of the array. Yeah, and it starts generating power there. Yeah, it's, it's clearly not going to be high irradiance, but yeah, I don't know to what extent some of these variations here are also affected by that because that's something that I'm still working on fixing. I assume that this will flatten out a little bit once we have that component in place. Right now I just pulled out the, uh, the, the long wave component yeah, to see in order to demonstrate that that is actually my problem here. And while it's getting a better fit the whole way along, clearly that would be better if we were actually calculating that as well. I don't know whether white or black would be better because you, I mean you're going to the white's going to be reflecting things back probably still in the yeah uh, that, that would still be reflecting in the visible you know, to the higher albedo so that might be better uh, especially if you have yeah uh, if you have a transparent back contact on your cell um, and but I was also working in in other yeah in other times with the uh, factors of the uh, diffuse versus direct irradiance and it really does seem to make yeah, a bit of a difference when the albedo on the ground is high due to snow cover you can see a much larger the, uh, power output from the array than at the same time of year when it's mm -hmm. clear on the ground and that's that's completely that's diffuse hand. light that's not being reflected yeah. back, yeah. back of things the, the back contact is okay could, yeah. could that be just part because it's colder and it's more efficient when it's colder? That, that's going to also affect it. That's going to affect it on both days. Okay. If the temperature is similar, but the yeah, the albedo changes, you so you so you see cold days with and without snow, you have a different output. Okay, so it is. I don't have numbers on it, but <coughs> yes, you, you do see a bit of a change in the output, assuming that the snow is not covering with the same way. You see a very <laughs> different change. <laughs> Yeah, and you have the same wind speed and whatever too, so it's comparable. Um, now we're getting into a lot of variables at once, and there's a lot of analysis. Because there was there wind speed in that one equation. We're future order. Yeah. Well, let's Cloud thank cover. Dave again. Okay.